On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, what did he say and what did he do and what did he intend for us? And what questions do people have about something that is so common that once in a while people take it for granted? Let's not do that, but receive it with gladness. Hi, I'm Pastor Ken Larson with Trinity Lutheran Church and School in Delray Beach, Florida. We're at 400 North Swinton, and we invite you to worship every Sunday, 8.30 and 10.30. And I invite you to join us in this Bible study, which comes on the scene around 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. Join us and send us your questions if you have any, or if you have a some topic or Bible book that you'd like us to tackle, oh, we'd like to hear from you. Ken Larson, 42 at hotmail.com. All right. Or you can call the church and leave a message. There it is on the screen, 278-1737 in area code 561. Sounds like a radio program, doesn't it? Well, the question before us today, and for a week or two or three, what does the Bible say about the Lord's Supper? It says a lot of things about the Lord's Supper. And some of you studied it when you were 12 and 13 years old, 14 years old, and some of you have never studied it in depth. And that's one of the reasons I want to go with you into the scriptures where Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood. Would you like to do that with us? And I do invite uh, your questions. On the night in which he was betrayed, this is the sentence that introduces Jesus' depiction of the Lord's Supper when he says something that is totally different from what was being celebrated on that night in which he was betrayed into the hands of evil men. About 1,400 years after it happened, Leonardo da Vinci, the great Renaissance painter, uh, depicted the Lord's Supper in a way that uh, was not probable. That is, they were reclining at table, according to the scriptures, but bringing it into his century. Uh, the painter depicted a table and I always want to count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There are 12 of them. And uh, which one is which? I don't know. I don't know. And as I said, you probably have some lingering questions about the Lord's Supper. And I want to entertain those as we go along. Whenever something comes up, oh, yo, that reminds me. I wanted to ask this, please. Uh, jump right in without an introduction. You don't have to raise your hand in this small group. And if two people speak at once, well, one of them will drop out and wait for the other. The Lord's Supper. I want to talk about the background in Exodus 12, where the Passover was given, ordered uh, by the Lord God. And then uh, the institution of Jesus Christ on the night in which he was betrayed. So we're going to look at the occasion for that, the words that he spoke, the actions that he took, and his intent. What did Jesus want to happen in this mysterious mystery called the Lord's Supper? And then, of course, what are the values and what are the blessings that we receive in this supper? That's a big thing to talk about. And then maybe we should talk about the proper reception. All right. You have any questions? <laughs> Anybody want to pop in here with a question already? I'm surprising you with this topic. You got a little hint in the email. And um, I don't intend for it to be a heavy dose of doctrine, although it is doctrine, it is teaching. I want it to be for you and for me a, 
a chance to look at the relationship that the Lord's Supper establishes and feeds and nourishes to every Christian who receives the Lord's Supper. Questions? Well, I'm sure you'll have some. So that's not Da Vinci. That's a rather modern uh, painter. Don't know the person's name, sorry. Um, but there are 12. And uh, the young one at the left of Jesus is probably the Apostle John. He was one of the youngest and lived longer than all the rest. He was the one, you know, that they say did not die a martyr's death. But somewhere in his 90s, he died on the island of Patmos where he had been banished. He was in exile. Revelation chapter 1. The Lord's Supper. What other names are given to the Lord's Supper? Can you name some? Sacrament of the yeah. altar. Sacrament of the altar. Go ahead. Communion. Communion. Eucharist. Eucharist, thank you. There's a couple more. No? Well, let's look at the list. This is one that you might not know. Uh, Paul, in discussing the fact that when they came to the Lord's Supper, he said, it's not the Lord's table that you are going to. As some people brought their food and ate it and didn't wait for the others. It was a, it was a mess. Um, communion, you mentioned uh, in one place, in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, it, the supper is called the cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not a communion or a participation in the blood of Christ? And the breaking of bread. This is one you probably would think about um, in Acts 2.42. That the early church continued in the apostles' teaching or doctrine in the prayers, in the breaking of bread, and the fellowship. I may not have had those in exact order. But the breaking of bread is used a couple of times. And then, as you mentioned, the Eucharist. Now, there's one more that you mentioned that's not in the Bible. The sacrament of the altar. Okay. I looked. I, I looked and looked and looked. And I'm trying to determine the history of that. It was already called the sacrament. And Luther was not the first one to say, well, it's the sacrament of the altar to distinguish it from the sacrament of baptism. An altar is a... I want to ask you uh, a sideways question here. Can you see all of those seven on the screen? Yes. Yes. None of them are obscured today? No. no. All right. That's a good news. That's good. Just slight, for me, it's just slightly on the right from, our, uh, from us. From us showing up on the right. Okay. A few letters. You're not missing any letters today. No, you. I am. Oh. Okay. I don't know if I can make thing make our picture smaller. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't want to click something for fear. No, hours. no. <laughs> no. Uh, I'll I'll hope that it uh, is better. Okay. So, what was the occasion? Now, I'm not talking about uh, the upper room. I'm not talking about the night in which he was betrayed. I'm talking about Exodus chapter 12, the Passover, the first Passover. So we have to talk about the first Passover and the last Passover, really, the last. So, uh, Judy, would you lead us off by reading from Exodus 12, 1 to 6, and I'm going to click so that you continue to read. Uh, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be, oh, this, yeah, this month mm -hmm. shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. 
Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they, shall then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts, and you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn. In this manner, you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. <coughs> Excuse me. Both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. <coughs> Excuse me. Can you imagine that night, which was remembered every year? during the first month of their, the Jewish year, as they counted the months, the, the, year, the month of Nisan, not the car, but the month. I'm probably not pronouncing that according to the Hebrew, and that's a, what I've always said, the 14th day. And it's determined by the position and the coming of the first new moon after the vernal equinox. The what? <laughs> well, it's that day in uh, in the early part of the year, March, April, when there is an equal number of hours in the day and an equal number of hours in the night, according to sunrise and sunset. And um, so that happens. And then the first full moon after that, which could be the next night or the next day. So it's basically, it's yes. basically right around our, our springtime then when we yes. go into spring? Okay. And that determines, that determines when the Passover is. And you will probably note if you look into the, when do we celebrate Easter? Sure. Yep. <laughs> and counting back uh, from Easter, the number of uh, 40 days plus the Sundays, which are not Sundays in Lent, you will arrive at our um, Ash Wednesday. But getting toward Easter, when you talk about what we call Holy Week with Maundy Thursday and Good Friday, we celebrate Maundy Thursday, and that is also determined by the same kind of thing. Somebody went to work and made a calendar like perpetually forever and ever when when a day of when that day will be for Maundy Thursday and Good Friday. The night in which he was betrayed is the Thursday night. And so what it happens that in many years when the Jewish people are celebrating Passover, we are celebrating a part of our Holy Week. It's not always exact. And sometimes it's the very day. I can't tell you today why we occasionally differ, but it's based on the observations of the new moon after that day in the spring when there are equal number of hours in the day and night. Um, it's, um, it's a calendar kind of thing. Well, the important part of this story story that you just read, thank you, Judy, it's a long reading, is that God is doing something miraculous. You know about the ten plagues, 
And you probably remember that the final plague was, I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. That was rather unsettling, to say the least. And this is the straw that broke the camel's back. This is when Pharaoh finally said, get out of here. I don't want to see you anymore. And 600,000 men plus women and children began heading east toward the promised land. This was God's deliverance from slavery. And you get the you get the metaphor, you get the figure of speech that in the New Testament, this is the prefiguring, the prophecy, the type of us being released from slavery to sin by the blood of the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Mm -hmm. You cannot read this Exodus 12 passage without thinking about Jesus Christ. I don't think you can. No. And we could spend a lot more time studying this verse by verse and finding all the parallels. Um, it would take a long time. Uh, this lamb would be without blemish. Which is Christ. And that's Christ. Right. All right. So this is what they did. Now imagine an Israelite family. It, they take a lamb and they're going to have it roasted. I don't know what roasted lamb tasted like, but it probably was pretty good. But they had to eat it in a hurry. But the blood of the lamb, they took and they painted it there. They painted it on the door and the lintel. I think the lintel is the top. We call that a header beam. <laughs> a two by six that keeps the rest of the wall up. Well, they painted that. And everyone believed the Lord's word. And when the angel of death passed over th that land, when the angel saw the blood, he passed over those homes. Of course, Pharaoh and his, the people in his nation, country, they did not do this. The command and promise wasn't given. I said, command and promise, law and gospel. The Lord commands it. And in that command, in that command, he is saying, I want you to believe my promise. We're going to do what? We're going to put blood on our doors. And what will happen? You will not die. Okay. And they believed his promise. Well, I think they were motivated. They had been in slavery. They had been, uh, their taskmasters had been very hard on them. I want you to make bricks. And then I want you to make bricks without straw. It wasn't easy being slaves to the Egyptians. I'm always amazed at how specific all of the commands were as to how to do this even. Yes. Um, you know, right down to wearing your shoes and having your belt belted to a certain degree and, and all of that. It was very specific. It was, you just don't, everybody picks the lamb however they want to do it or whatever. Oh, yeah. Bread and butter and bitter herbs. The bitter herbs uh, signified the, the years of slavery in Egypt. So I, I imagine, you know, teenagers and, and eight-year-olds or, or try to get a four-year-old out of the house in a hurry. And then they want to change clothes in the last minute. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're going to be ready to go. Get your backpack all, or all packed. We are leaving. And nobody was left behind. They all left. And they gave them gold and silver and other good things. They didn't leave empty-handed. The Egyptians were glad to see them go. It was an awful, awful time for the Egyptians. It was a wonderful time. And then they met up with that deep blue sea, and that's why I always call this uh, this uh, 
expression between the devil and the deep blue sea. <laughs> there they were at the edge of the sea. Well, that's another Moses story we're not going to get into. We're really just talking about the Lord's Supper and the occasion for Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper when, when he was finished, he had just finished celebrating this required feast. And everyone kept it every year, although there were many years in which they, without faith and without believing, and because they were disobedient, and because they had forgotten the Lord and had worshipped the Baals, there were many years in which the Israelites did not celebrate the Passover. That's another story. Let none of it remain. No leftovers. Burn it. It is the Lord's Passover. And uh, would someone uh, read this continuation? Evelyn? Yeah, thank you. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you, on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And the people believed that promise. It seems like it would have been hard to believe. It's so distant from everything else that people know from what they believe normally. They had already seen all the other plagues that God got put on the land, so. Evelyn, that's a, a good point. A reason to believe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the Egyptian magic workers were able to keep up with Moses for, I believe, it was the first three signs the first three plagues and then after that they said we can't match that all right so it was to be remembered this day shall be for you a memorial day and you shall keep it as a feast to the lord throughout your generations as a statute forever you shall keep it as a feast there were three required feasts for the Jewish people, and this was one of them. Maybe at this point in history, I should call them the Hebrews, the Hebrews. Questions? Comments? Okay, we'll move on to another reading. Who hasn't read today yet? Chris, are you there? Chris is muted. I know Robert is busy. Sorry about that. Yes. No, oh, go um, ahead. Would you read this, please? Yes. Yeah. Right. Exodus 12, 21 to 22. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it into the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintels and the two doors posts with the blood that is in the basin. Thank you. Now, I think uh, some of you are, have tender hearts toward uh, an innocent little lamb <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> and it bothers you. <laughs> but um, you know, the hundreds of thousands of cattle that are slaughtered and, you know, you have a beef roast or uh, some ground up beef and you enjoy it. Your, your heart is not as tender toward that, that steer that provided a meal for you and others. I suppose not, unless you're a vegetarian, you eat none of these. But that's, that's another story. I'm just saying that this is a little lamb, but that was normal for them to eat lamb. And I don't believe that most, I don't remember 
the last I can, can you remember the last time you had lamb when it was less than fourteen dollars a pound <laughs> oh that's good reason <laughs> I just remember my grandmother's making it with lem, uh, mint jelly mint jelly yes uh, and was it around Easter that that uh, of course yes uh -huh. I think I, I you know I was little tradition I remember that too and it was only then Another thing I remember, though, not much because I did grow up basically in the city till I moved to the country, but is that the killing of chickens or ducks. In my case, it was a duck I saw. And it was like people did that just basically they stopped. I don't even know if they stopped. They might still do it. But, you know, when, by the time I was five or six, you know, with the with the um, delivery system of produce, you know, stuff like that or meat and stuff. Okay, well, a tradition uh, is is pretty strong, but at fourteen dollars a pound, I don't think. And if you go out to a restaurant and have lamb, if you find a <laughs> restaurant that serves it, uh, it's it's not going to be less than twenty dollars. I don't believe. We've had it served here for. Um, they have a once a month birthday celebration in our dining room on the first Tuesday, and uh, they they've had it like uh, with a lamb chop with maybe um, some seafood or something, kind of a surf and turf type of thing. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, one lamb chop, uh, but we'll see it then sometimes, which is rare. Yeah. Okay, well, I don't want you to get too tenderhearted toward this. <laughs> this was commanded by the Lord and because uh, everyone had uh, or could get a lamb. Okay. Now, who, I don't think, has everybody read? We have a small group today. Yeah, I'll start again. Please. Okay, Exodus 12, 25 to 28. Remember the sacrificial lamb. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshiped. Then the people of Israel went and did so, as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. So they did. They did. So this is a summary Often what you have when you read the Old Testament is you have two parts and they are more or less equal to each other. You have the command that the Lord God gives to Moses or to one of the prophets and the words are written down. The words are written down according to that command and promise. And then part two is when Moses or one of the prophets uh, recites or tells what the Lord had said. And it will be a repetition or a near repetition of the same words that came from the Lord. And the Bible records both the giving of the command and promise and the telling to the people. And in this case, it also tells the obedience of the people there in verse 28. They did what the Lord had commanded. And to me, that's amazing that every one of them, 600,000 men plus women and children, that's a huge, huge crowd. I, I would like to read a book about how they were provided for once they got across the sea and their backpacks were empty. <laughs> Uh, I don't, you have to read what they took with him. Well, I want you to remember the sacrificial lamb points to Christ. That's the main reason I brought Exodus 12 into this. We certainly could start with Matthew chapter 26 and read the institution of the Lord's Supper and say, well, there it is. That is that's all we need to know. But there's much more depth and much more interesting to connect it with the Passover because Jesus is connecting it with the Passover. 
But it begins, the connection in the New Testament begins sooner than that, when John the Baptist, that's John the Baptist, who saw Jesus coming toward him, behold, this is what I remember, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. He knew. God told him. He knew this was the one. He, he knew that when Mary came to visit Elizabeth yes. and say she was pregnant he, already. He was the first one to meet Jesus. <laughs> yes, he really was. And they were close in age, uh, basically, too. Six months. Six months apart. And they were cousins. Mm -hmm. This was um, God's way of putting people together the right time in the right place for the right purpose and the right result is what comes of it. You know, when God makes plans <laughs> and he, he slowly, bit by bit through history, the, the wheel turns, the wheel turns. That's what I want to talk about is the passage of history. But first, let's let Peter speak. Um, and Evelyn, uh, you are really ready to read from First Peter. Okay. You were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, First Peter 1, 18 to 20. And Peter is uh, remembering the connection between the Passover lamb without blemish or spot, who shed his blood. And his blood was the ransom price to pay for our sins not with silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. It's pure gospel. This is pure gospel. You can memorize this. You were ransomed. Yes, you were. And so was I. <laughs> now, I want to talk about that passage of history in a very, very brief way. <laughs> Look how long it would take us to rehearse what happened between the first Passover and the coming of Christ. The Exodus is dated by most conservative people as being around 1400 BC. And that's why I use the 1400 years. There's no exact number. And you do a lot of history. You do a lot of comparison with the the rulers in the kingdom on the left, that is the the civil rulers, to, to get these dates, to get this length of time. So what happens, and you know the stories, Moses does lead Israel out of Egypt, and then comes after Moses' death, Joshua and the period of the judges, and then they clamored for a king, and the Lord said, you'll be sorry. And he gave them a king. And some were good, but most were evil. The prophets spoke during the time of those kings and the people sometimes listened, but mostly would not listen. They went into terrible uh, idolatry and uh, leaving the faith. That's apostasy. Apostasy is not one of the things that uh, that we know. Uh, it's not. I'm sorry. It's not in our common vocabulary. Let me help. The Stasi thing has to do with standing. Standing. And apo is away. To, so to apostatize is to stand away from something. In the case of the Bible, it's standing away from what God had promised, what God had commanded. In other words, the true religion. So apostasy is, an, is a terrible thing. You, you don't want to see anyone apostatize. That is, leave the faith for non-faith. 
So that was a terrible thing. The prophets warned, and the prophets made the prophets made promises that came from God, but the people, by and large, did not listen. The Lord um, left the remnant for Himself. Comment, Chris? Yes, on apostasy. So I'm in another Bible class, and they were talking about the ages of the church. I don't have that list in front of me, although it was sent to me. Um, and they said we are in the age of the church of apostasy, which which happened after the Renaissance, about 1800 to now. The church is in the invisible sense, always according to Jesus' promise, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Okay, right. so the true church will always remain. There will always be some, a remnant. It, Every at various times, as, as you're learning during the last 2000 years, the church has been at times very strong and at very uh, other times a very weak. That is the visible church, the visible, not the invisible church. The visible church, which is composed of denominations and meetings and decisions, uh, the visible church at times. Um, does not follow the teachings of the scripture. And in those times, um, I'm told that we are in a post-Christian uh, era in our country, and the world is largely uh, post-Christian. Well, that is uh, inevitable when the devil gets the ears of people and teaches them things that are not true. And when God's spokesmen, the pastors and professors and teachers of the church, begin to doubt what God has said and teach things that God has not said, you know, making commands that God has not made and letting loose on things that God has commanded, well, that's when the church, the visible church, becomes weak and ineffective and uh, unable to be a help to people in their real problems. Now, that's a terrible summary, but um, that's off the cuff. I hope it, it goes along with what you are studying, Chris. This was Revelations, and they were outlining the different eras. Uh, All right. It, it's a Revelation study. It's just, it was just, a, we haven't gotten to any of that, but that was just a chart. If you study Revelation 1, 2, and 3, and you read the letter, the letters, yes. the seven letters to the seven churches, you will find um, what some consider, and I can't prove it from the scriptures, to be kind of like models or types of the various kinds of churches that are in the world, visible yes. churches. Yes. And Although the mind puts two and two together, it doesn't always come out exact. <laughs> yeah, for, the, for example, one of them, I forget which one, is you have lost your first love. Yeah. And that's a terrible thing to be said of people. Yes. But I know that it happens. What our job is in the church is to cling to God's word, to believe everything that he has said, to obey what he has commanded, and not to let go of what we know is true, not ever let go of any of it. I think you know me by now. You know my heart. You know that uh, I have been captured by... Uh, God. <laughs> that's a terrible word, captured by... I have had good teachers whom I loved and whom I follow, but they didn't teach me to follow them. They taught me to put my head in the book, mm -hmm. God's book. And I'm going to do that with, by his grace until he calls me. And that's enough of saying about that. But yeah. we have daily to fight against false doctrine and false practice that are at loose in the world. I'm going to stop there. Uh, and just say that the people in those 1400 years did not follow God 
by and large. It is. It's terrible. You can't believe. Why would they go putting up a stick in the wilderness and worshiping it? Why would they fashion uh, things that they said were uh, pictures of or, or models of, of Baal and, and worship that false god? Why would they follow their heathen neighbors? I didn't make any sense. I was, I, I was, I was just thinking, you know, I'm wondering if they followed them because they thought they had a, a better material life or something that, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence and uh, allowed other than God to, um, to start to, to guide them, unfortunately, uh, and be governed by things and other people or other governments um, for the yeah. most part. Yeah, certainly, and, and we have today the prosperity gospel, which preaches the same thing. Mm -hmm. The Babylonian captivity was the punishment for that. They were warned about it, and many of them did. Most of them did go into captivity in Babylonia. Then they returned after 70 years, and they began to rebuild. You read Ezra and Nehemiah. I have threatened to take up those books <laughs> and, and uh, study them with you. It's really a busy time with lots of setbacks and disappointments. And then when I say there were 400 years of silence between Malachi and Matthew, there wasn't silence. Well, the prophets weren't speaking. Uh, no one was writing a biblical book. Other books were written, historical books, such as First and Second Maccabees, and First and Second Maccabees are valuable to tell us what happened, uh, some of what happened, uh, in those 400 years. Okay, that 400 is part of the 1400. Got it? So what happens next? Jesus is born. We have a new era. He grows to manhood and he calls disciples and he chooses some as apostles and teaches and he heals the sick and raises the dead. But he also, because of that, faces opposition by the religious leaders of the day. And then those who hate him plot to kill him. But not during the, not during the feast. I, I have a a problem I need to take care of immediately. And what I'm going to do is, uh, yeah, is not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. So they were avoiding Passover time because the city would be filled with people, many of them who knew and believed this Messiah, Jesus, the Christ, and they were very careful and uh, because they didn't want to cause an uproar. All right, you know about that. So at the same time, Jesus is calmly making plans to celebrate the Passover. You are not surprised to hear that, are you? Mm -hmm. He goes as it has been determined of him, for him. It is like Jesus is following a script that his Father in heaven has laid out, and he knows the script. Picture an actor on the stage, only Jesus is not an actor. He is the character himself. He's playing himself, only it's not a play. He is going to be sacrificed, and he knows it. And even though he knows it, he gathers his disciples. Especially now he gather, gathers just the twelve. Three times in the New Testament, Jesus predicts what is going to happen. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. Every year, around the time of the, after the transfiguration, I read that passage uh, from the lectern 
and this told me <laughs> and told everybody Lent is beginning. This is how Lent begins. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written of the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles, and will be mocked, and shamefully treated, and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him, and on the third day he will rise. End of quote. Jesus is speaking. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hid from them, and they did not grasp what was said. It is interesting that Jesus is reading the script, and you notice he is speaking of himself in the third person. Mm -hmm. Not I. The Son of Man is his, the, the, the term he most often used for himself. Everything that is written about me is going to be accomplished. Everything. And then here is the script. Delivery, mock, shamefully treated, spit, scourge, kill. That's the crucifixion. And then the resurrection is promised. But they didn't get it. Why didn't they get it? It was hid from them. And even when it happened, they looked at it and said, it is a ghost. <laughs> Remember when he was in the upper room and they were in the upper room and he suddenly appeared before them. And he said, do you have anything to eat? <laughs> I think that's, that's just a wonderful statement of by the resurrected Jesus. The Lord's Supper, the occasion, the occasion. I'm looking at the time, and I'm aiming. We're getting close to about 50 minutes. And I'm trying to decide whether this is a good stopping place. You know. Yeah, I think we can go a couple more. If you have any questions, I'll, I'll pause for your questions while I figure out where we are. Any comments on the occasion of the night in which he was betrayed? Okay. We are going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus will be arrested, accused, and crucified. Crucified under Pontius Pilate, we say in the Creed. But before then, Jesus will show the Twelve how love serves. It's interesting to you, maybe, that John, the apostle, writes his gospel, but does not mention the Lord's Supper institution in the upper room that night. One guess, and it's just a guess, who knows, who knows the intention of the Holy Spirit in the mind of John, the apostle? But one explanation that has been offered over the many, many years is that John knew, knew of the other gospel writers having already taken care of the institution of the Lord's Supper. I'm not talking about John chapter 6, which appears to be a pointing forward to what would happen. That's the feeding of the 5,000, and unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. And this was a hard say saying, and they began to go away, because who could believe it? And then he asked his disciples, will you also go away? And Peter, uh, ever the volunteer, says, you have the words of eternal life. And we believe. So back to John 13, this is when he took a towel and a basin and washed their feet. This is when he said, love one another as I have loved you, going into John 14. And it finishes up with John 17, where Jesus uh, prays a, a prayer that is very, very deep, making the connection between him and the Father 
and between that connection and believers. Very moving prayer. And Jesus will se celebrate the Passover with these men, connecting that feast with a new feast. And that's what we're going to talk about, God willing, next time. <laughs> that's a good place to end. And uh, what you can do for homework is read Matthew 26 and find the Lord's Supper there. And if you're really eager beaver, you can read, you can find it in Mark chapter 14 and Luke chapter 22. Now, how do I get those numbers? I told you once. Do you remember how you get those, those chapters to find the Lord's Supper? You can go to the Luther's little catechism and find a lot of yeah, answers. Yeah, they're all there. But if you just had a Bible, how would you find the, the Lord's Supper? You count two chapters back from the end of each gospel. Oh. Matthew has 28 chapters, go back to 26. Mark has 16 chapters, go back to 14. And Luke has 24 chapters. You can find that out by going to the end. <laughs> and then go back to chapters to Luke 22. And then your eyes will find it in the chapter. Okay. Do you have any closing questions or comments or things? that uh, I, I sprung this on you without, uh, without any notice, without telling you what we were going to do this time, this week. And uh, I hope you will find that it isn't, well, Pastor, we know all this. Uh, you may have once, and you may have forgotten it. You know why? We don't rehearse it. It's often assumed. I don't want to do that. And remember, this class, this, this lesson, this Bible study, is not for the, just for the six of you who are here. It's also for the 10 or 15 that tune in later. And I don't know who they are. Every once in a while, there'll be 25 or 30 that tune in later. Okay. This may be new to them, and I'm serving them as well as you. I hope you keep that in mind. There's an evangelistic purpose, kind of hidden way in the back. I enjoy teaching you. I'm glad for your faithfulness in showing up. If you weren't here, me talking to a blank screen, not much. <coughs> Not much fun. Judy, I hope that has no consequence. No, that's just the, it's it's a sinus type of thing. Yeah, so. yeah, Jeannie has the same. Well, God be with you until we meet again, and I will pray a prayer. I will pray uh, again for that meeting at, uh, oh, around uh, 11. Pastor said it was probably start about quarter to 12. Uh, Thursday because he spent he spent a, a fair amount of time with our Thursday morning Bible class which I think should be on YouTube if anybody wants to listen he yeah. kind of laid an outline if they want to start to you know hear a little bit about uh, what okay. the whole talk is going to be and anyway because that's what our Thursday morning Bible class ended up being all right let's uh, let's talk about that off the recording Lord God please bless your church and the plans that you are making for your church and bless this congregation, Trinity Lutheran Church and School in Delray Beach, that uh, the plans that you make for us will be accomplished. Modify our plans to, to meet with yours. Bless the parts of our plans that are in accord with your wishes and wants and plans for us. And help us to determine always that we trust in you and not in our own wisdom or strength. Lord God, please bless us in our week. Keep us free from disease and grant that all of these that we worship will be able to get their COVID-19 immunizations and uh, go on with a little bit less fear in this world that threatens us daily and keep the evil one far from us. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ who conquered him with his resurrection over death. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. And we say amen. Amen. 
Amen.